Welcome to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. In this podcast, we will focus on successful marketing methods for advisors that generate prospects and clients. We will learn from the best in the industry on how advisors in the trenches today are growing their practices. Join us for this journey where Brad draws from years of expertise and guest experts to help advisors reach their full potential. Welcome to the Be Advised Leading with Value podcast with Brad Swinehart of White Glove. I'm Patrice Sikora. Brad has quite the well-rounded resume when it comes to this episode's topic, Seminar Best Presentation Practices. He's got marketing, he's got coaching, but why should I go on? Brad, why don't you tell us more about the experience you bring to helping advisors? I'm able to have kind of a unique perspective when it comes to seminar best presentation practices and really pulling from a few sources. Working at White Glove over the last few years has really gotten me to be able to be in front of advisors who have seen real success doing seminars. The founders of White Glove are both financial advisors that built a very successful practice using seminar marketing and being able to pick their brains and have that one-on-one coaching with advisors that really saw massive success with seminars has really helped launch me into this career that I'm in now. And then when we pair that with all the presentation skills training that White Gloves team goes through, I've sat through every single one of those coaching sessions and helped coach a team of account executives to train financial advisors. So I've got to learn from some of the best in the industry on best presentation skills and overall speaking engagements of how to really hone that craft. So you pair that with the the one-on-one education with successful advisors, the professional speaking coaches that I've worked with, and then ultimately over the last few years, working with thousands of financial advisors that are crushing it using seminars, but also seeing what not to do has given me a really unique perspective on how to speak to seminar best presentation practices. Why do a seminar? What are the key benefits to this? There's a few key benefits to to keep in mind when you're thinking about is are seminars right for me? First off, scalability. Being able to sit in front of 20 to 30 interested attendees to hear what you have to say. There's no other marketing message that can get out there that can provide you with that direct one-on-one contact with so many people all at once. Also, when you pair that with an educational topic, when you really reach out to those people that are looking to be educated, that means the people that are sitting in your room, whether it's a library or community center or a virtual setting, they're there for an education, which means that they're interested in what you have to say. Bundle that all together and what that means for the financial advisor is credibility. What you're doing is you're setting yourself up to be credible in the eyes of all of those attendees, and that is not something that fades easily. So if you can set yourself up as that professional, that go-to, that thought leader in your community, seminars are an absolutely game changer for a financial advisor. And you mentioned virtual seminar. What is the benefit to a virtual seminar versus being there in person and having that audience? You mean besides your potential attendee being so relaxed that they can sit at home in their pajamas? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but there are, you know, that joking aside, there are some real benefits to doing seminars virtually. And one is just that ease, that comfort level of your attendee that they, they can be completely comfortable when listening to you. And if you really have that powerful message, you're still going to be able to connect with that audience. One other thing that is a huge benefit for virtual seminars that many advisors don't think about is now the entire U.S., wherever you're registered or licensed, it can be your backyard, mm-hmm. wherever you've always wanted clients from then now you can you can reach those people with a virtual seminar because they don't have to drive to the library. They, you don't have to worry about finding a venue near your office. Your office could be anywhere. I've seen advisors that have a successful practice where they walk out of their beach house after their webinar and then they go and they, oh. they relax down there when they just did a, a webinar to Minnesota. And that is totally possible with virtual seminars. And it's it really opens up the country to advisors that really want to expand their practice and really scale. Pair seminars of scaling and that virtual environment, it's a win-win. It's just not fair to be able to go down to the beach right after that. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Are there different skills that are needed for a virtual seminar versus a physical one? Absolutely. You're going to want to update your presentation. You're going to want to change your 
your messaging, virtual seminars should be a little bit shorter than, than in-person events. You absolutely can grab someone's attention for 60 to 90 minutes live in person, mostly because it'd be very awkward to stand up and walk out of the room. You don't have that same burden on your attendees when it's virtual. They can absolutely just scroll up to the right and click that X button and bounce out or go back to scrolling through Facebook. You want to hone your presentation. And that doesn't necessarily mean less slides, but it does mean less content. You want to keep that moving, keep that cadence up. But there's also some benefits from the virtual seminar when you are shortening that. One, one follow-up is immediate. You can call someone directly after your virtual seminar. You can have your staff reach out to every single person that attended immediately right after the event. That's sort of a hidden benefit to doing something virtual where you don't have to wait to the next day to follow up with this person. You can hit them right mm -hmm. then when that lead is hottest and willing to book an appointment with you. And you also mentioned educational content being very important. Are there some topics that do better than other topics at a seminar? You know, oftentimes I'm talking to advisors and they're always looking to to play the marketer. They want to say, hey, this is what's hot in the environment right now. This is what I want to talk about. Or the worst is this is what I want to sell. What I would say is just take a step back from that. Focus on education. Focus on providing real value to your attendees. Again, the whole point of a seminar is to build credibility. So if you can focus on that education and let the marketing team actually focus on what's working today, not necessarily what that advisor is focused on selling or ultimately what they want to do with that, that end client. But if you can educate them in a, in a way that is effective, don't play marketer. Don't try to invent a new topic. Go with something tried and true that can deliver consistent results. And then you've got the room full of people. They've come. You've got 20, 30 people out there. You walk out and what do you do? How do you start? <laughs> you know what? I always say skip the boring pleasantries. If you have someone that can introduce you either virtually or in person, that's great. Have someone go up there, do the housekeeping notes of the you know restrooms over here, questions at the end, X, Y, and Z, you know, and they can do that introduction for you. But once you're on stage, once you're live, once you're that person that they're looking to, you have less than a minute to capture their attention. When you walk out on the stage, when you flip on that webcam, you're either telling that audience right away that, hey, I am just like everybody else. This is going to be boring and you might learn something from it. Or, hey, whoa, I'm going to lean in because this person has something to say. This is interesting. I didn't expect this. And that's what you need to focus on is that power opening, if you will. Think about kicking in that door, a flashbang opening. You've, you've heard that type of terminology before, but you absolutely need something that is going to capture their attention. And whether that's a classic dollar bill opening or a personal story where maybe you start halfway through and then you back up to the beginning and, and get everybody engaged, but picture your audience your first 30 seconds, is that going to get someone to lean in and say, what is this guy talking about? Mm -hmm. Or is that going to get them to kind of relax in their chair, fold their arms and just begrudgingly prepare for the next 60 minutes of their life? And that's something that when you have that audience, you have one chance to have that powerful opening to get that engagement. You mentioned a virtual introduction. Can you mix the virtual with the physical? You absolutely could. There's some technicalities around that and you want to make sure that your audience is prepared. You know, either way with your virtual setting, you want to have a video on. You want to show that you're live. You want to you want to have hand gestures and you want to be moving around so you can show that. If you're going to do a live seminar, you know, translating that back into a virtual setting, you're probably better off just scheduling another one and just doing the presentation twice so you can really focus on what you're doing. All right. Now you mentioned getting out there with that big opening. How should someone structure the rest of the talk? They've got the big whiz bang open and then what? One thing that you want to focus on is it's not the person who educates that most that's going to get the most clients. It's not the person who tells the most information that's going to get that audience to like them. You know, advisors often think, well, I need 120 slides and I need to tell them this and this and this and this and this. And you got to think that your audience is going to get inundated with that information and they're going to, they're going to lose interest. Information is now a commodity. I can pull out my smartphone and find out any of the statistics or information that I want. What they're there to do is to be educated and to be taught and to be illuminated. And that's what you want to focus on. So really keep that content down to three, maybe four items, because that's the most someone's going to retain throughout a seminar. 
one nice thing to do is to set up clear benchmarks. Over the next 40 minutes, we're going to learn these three things. And when you do that, you're building a checklist in your attendees mind that they're going to not only see the event moving forward, they're going to see that cadence, they're going to say, hey, this is progressing. But also when they start checking box one and checking box two, they're going to be mentally prepared for box three, and they're going to be paying attention to that. Start with that hourglass idea where you start with a broad topic, you kind of narrow down to the details. And then when you finish, you're going to be back broad and, and over encompassing. And one thing to do is just make sure you're embedding through all three of those, those topics, embed that close and make sure that, that you're, you're working that in through those three takeaways that you're going to walk them through over the next 40 minutes. Tell me more about embedding. Embedding is, is a technique that a presenter can use so that they can prepare the audience or the attendees for that final close at the end. So what you're going to do is, you know, maybe at the beginning of the class, you're going to say, this is part one of a two part class. You know, the, the first part is general education. The second part is the one on one consultation where we can actually answer your specific questions. That's one way to do it. The other each section, like I said, three sections, you might want to have a different form of embedding in each one. So maybe the first section, you tell a story, you tell a story of I was giving a seminar just like this. And one of the attendees came up to me afterwards and had some very specific tax questions. So we went back to my office and we set up an appointment and we X, Y, and Z, and this was the result. And you're telling a story so the audience is listening, but what you're also doing is outlining tactically what the next steps to work with you are. So you're embedding that into the presentation. And then again, maybe the second section you're saying, oh, in the second part of this class, we're going to cover X, Y, and Z. And you just work that into your presentation. You're not trying to close them right up front, but you are letting them know that at the end of this, there's going to be a close and this is what they can expect. Then how many times should you get out there and make it very clear? I want you to meet with me. I, I want to sit down and talk with you. What I would say is if you can work in the different types of trial closes, one in maybe each section, you know, at the very beginning, be very be frank and honest about it. Hey, this, this is what I do in my day job. But really, if you wait until the very end of your presentation and say, oh, by the way, now you're going to meet with me. Now we're going to have a presentation. Now you have to fill out an evaluation form or we're going to call you immediately after that. If you blindside your audience mm -hmm. with the next step, then you've already lost. There's no way that you can capture those people at the end. You need to warm them up throughout the entire presentation. So I would say the amount of times you need to do it is for each section that you're going to block off, have some sort of trial close in there or some embedding of what that next steps might look like, mm -hmm. but really just get them warmed up so that they're paying attention at the end that this isn't, this isn't an option. This is just what's next. This is how this is outlined. And you also mentioned using a personal story to illuminate a point, but do personal stories really work? Do jokes work? Do props work? <laughs> well, I'd say, you know what? The short answer is yes. Okay. Um, but the real answer is when you're in front of an audience and when you're giving your, your educational, your talk, people want to work with people that they like. So you need to be genuine. If you're not funny, telling a joke will be an awful choice for you. <laughs> it would be. It'd fall flat. <laughs> but, but what you could do is you could just let everybody know, hey, you know what? I'm really boring. And the next 60 minutes is going to be really tough on you because I am just, I'm dry. I'm very calculated. I, I like to focus on statistics and that might not appeal to everybody. So in the next 60 minutes, you're going to get really bored, but Hey, you know what? I'm going to give each one of you a Nerf ball. And if I really bore you, you know, toss this at my head throughout the presentation, I'll try to liven it up, but that's just me. I'm naturally very analytical. I'm not funny. Right. But if you, if you could be genuine, if you can hone in on your own personality and your own ability, then use that. Use what use your strengths and your personality to your advantage. Don't try to shove in a joke or use props if you're not comfortable with it. Now, when I say you have to be comfortable with it and be genuine, that's going to take time. Everyone hates public speaking just in general. When they say, would you, more people are afraid of public speaking than death. That means you'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy. Mm. So, <laughs> okay. so it takes practice to be genuine. It takes more practice. So get up there, get comfortable with your presentation and get comfortable in your own skin in front of an audience. And if you can come off as genuine, you're going to book more appointments. You're going to connect well with your audience. And that absolutely can have 
props and jokes and personal stories mixed in there. And you should, but it should fit with your personality and you shouldn't be trying to do something that's outside of what you normally would be like as a person. How do you do that? Is it just practice? It's absolutely practice. It's identifying your strengths. One thing I would say is to focus on your why. Why are you doing that? Why? I mean, ultimately, sure, you want to pick up clients, you want to grow your practice, but that's not why you're a financial advisor. That's not why you're there to educate. You're there because you have a very strong passion because of X. Maybe it's a, a family story. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a something that happened in your personal life that led you to be a financial advisor to protect the people that you care about. But you have that driving force. And if you can identify that, if you just, before you ever build a presentation, understand why you want to give that presentation, why you care about passionately educating your community and being that thought leader. Once you can identify that one thing that drives you, then build your presentation around that. Then build out, you know what? I can, I can tell a joke here, or I can, I can tell a little personal story about myself right now. What's something that's very interesting when you're giving an educational event and when you're talking to a crowd in general is when you can hone in on a personal story, almost the, the more personal it is, the more universal it becomes. When you're sharing yourself, then more people can relate to that. So don't be afraid to identify why you're doing that and focus on that when you're building out your presentation and, and learning how to be genuine. But absolutely, you have to practice. You have to know your material cold. You shouldn't be you know, reading PowerPoint slides. You should be up there talking and educating and illuminating your audience, not, not running through a PowerPoint reading it word for word. You're going to lose people immediately if you start doing that. Putting yourself out there, being genuine, being vulnerable, really, how do you then transition to that final, I want to talk to you close? Oh, absolutely. Okay. So we talked about being genuine we talked about you focusing on education and value and then, okay, now how do you transition that into uh, let's do some business together? Right. And really what you want to, what you want to do is have a two part close. You're going to, you're going to hit that end of your content. You're going to, you're going to run up to the point where, you know what? my clothes, and this is something to dial into how long it takes you to do your clothes. Mm -hmm. And then make sure you always leave yourself that amount of time before the end of your presentation. Mm -hmm. Other than the, the opening, the close is the most important part of your seminar. And if you run short because you talk too much on topics or you took too many questions or whatever that is, and you don't give yourself enough time to close at the end, you really did yourself a, a grave injustice when it comes to your seminar. So plan that out. If it takes you seven minutes to close, you know what, if you're running up on time, you stop what you're doing and you move into that, that close when you know you ha hit that seven minute mark. So what you actually do, you've given your content, you're running up. I got seven minutes left. That's how long it takes me to, to run through my close. Then you step into that. So you bridge into the close of, Hey, we learned some great information today. We covered X, Y, and Z you do a quick recap. And then ultimately what you want to do is you want to do two separate closes. First, you're going to do the tactical close. And what that is, is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to tell people exactly how to meet with you. You want one clear option of what is next that it's, it's not an option of you can call me, you can, you can do this, you can do X, you can, as soon as you start giving them options, now you've lost it. There's one clear action that they need to take to meet with you. And that is you turn out your, your valuation form, you hand it to, to Matt in the back of the room and he will book your appointment and you tactically tell them this is the next steps. You're going to book your appointment off that form. He's going to pick a time and date. We're going to follow up with you with a phone call tomorrow. And then you're going to drive down to my office. You're going to get in your car. You're going to turn the key, you know, not that detailed, <laughs> but absolutely you're going to outline it tactically for those people in the audience that that's how their brain works. They want to know what are the next steps instructions. Think of it as an instruction. This is how you do the close. And that could be in-person evaluation form. That could be virtually you're going to book on the Calendly link that's in the chat right now, but you tell them very tactically, this is what the next steps are. And you outline those clearly. Now you've already embedded in section one that somebody did that they saw great success and now they're living happily ever after. So this isn't a blindsiding truth. This isn't a, a step that they weren't expecting. You've already told them that someone did this and they saw someone just like them did this and saw success. And now here's how you can 
act on that. So tactically close them first. And then you move into the, the softer, more emotional close. Because mm -hmm. you're going to have both types of people in your audience. You're going to have the people that just want to know what are the next steps. But you're going to have those people that, that want to make that decision with their heart. And when you can really kind of wrap that up in a nice bow of, hey, we learned some great things here today. You understand how to, how to book a meeting. But let's focus on why you signed up for this, this course in the first place, why you came in for this education. You did it because you're, you're concerned. You did it because you have things in your life that you want to make sure are taken care of. And we don't want to leave this event without taking care of that for you. We don't want to, we don't want to have you walk out without that box being checked. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to sit down. Maybe we work together. Maybe we don't, but I want that one hour meeting to be the most beneficial meeting you've spent with a, a professional this year. And I'm absolutely willing now that we've spent this time together and we've invested in each other. I'm willing to do that with you uh, with the, with the follow-up appointment. Let's, let's book part number two and that's how you're going to end up closing. So you're going to bridge into that, give yourself enough time, tactically close them first, and then you end on that emotional close. Should you hand out something to help them remember that they were there and maybe why they were there? If you can stay top of mind, if you can, you can have a, a clear call to action that is an offer. You know, I've, I've seen great software companies that will do a tax analysis or a social security breakdown or a retirement stress test, or maybe a book. Maybe you've written a book and you want to, you want to give that out to everybody that's books and appointment, or even something just silly like a, a folder or a candy bar or anything like that. You absolutely can. And if you phrase it right, it's not going to be cheapening your, your brand or your mm -hmm. image. What you're going to be doing is you want to attract those right people. But if you've, if you've outlined that in the, the presentation up until this point, then they know that, hey, there is that something, that extra little something to get them mm -hmm. moved off. You know what? Here's a, anybody that books an appointment is going to get this uh, social security filing guide. And I, I'm happy to hand that out to anybody that, that books with us today is if you built that out into your presentation, having that call to action, that extra little nudge, any more hooks you can get into those people is absolutely recommended. And it works wonderfully. They might have that. They think they got the information that they wanted. Maybe they see you as a professional, but if you can throw one more hook into them and you know what, if we, if we move forward to the second meeting, you're going to get this family estate organizer plan that helps with the state planning and generational planning, or you're going to get a social security guide, you know, anything that, that kind of pushes those people that are, you know what, I'm, I'm not ready yet, but I'm still pretty interested. If you can push those into that, that next step with you, I absolutely recommend that hook at the end. Anything that you can, that you can do to do that is, is highly encouraged. Is there anything special that we should be aware of when we're meeting with people who come from a seminar who are serious and they follow up? Is meeting with them different from meeting with someone you've gotten through different avenues? Oh, absolutely. Something that any professional just needs to focus on too when it comes from a seminar is you've led with value, you've led with education. There's two things that, that are a little bit different when it comes to a seminar attendee meeting with you for the first time. First off, they're not a nice warm referral where they know you and, and that you have that transfer of credibility from their friend or their family. So you want to, you want to take it slow. You want that first meeting should be something that you're really filling each other out. You want to see if they're a good fit, but you also want to see if you're a good fit for them. And, and that's something that um, you can really play on is that you don't necessarily need to work with everyone. And you can tell people that, look, mm -hmm. I might not be the best fit for you and you might not be the best fit for me because this is the type of person that I like to work with. But as long as you're upfront and honest, especially in that first meeting, like think of it as dating. You want to build that rapport. You want to get to know that person. Don't just dive into it with a, a nice hard sales pitch. You, know, you really want to do that analysis. You, you, everyone's kind of heard that you, you can't prescribe without without finding out what's wrong first and really take that mentality into that first meeting, especially when it comes to seminars. Any special ways to follow up too? One great thing about seminars is that when you're giving that presentation, when you have set yourself up as that educator, that thought leader, that that credibility is going to stick with you for a very long time. Now, not everybody that attended that seminar is ready today to make a change, to to develop a retirement plan, to look into a, a specific thing that you want to talk to them about. But that just because they're not ready now doesn't mean 
that they're never going to be ready or they're not an ideal candidate. So one thing that is just so important, especially with seminar leads compared to any other, is that you constantly nurture them, that that person might not be ready today. But if you stay top of mind that six months, eight months, you know, a year, two years down the road, when that life event happens, you're going to be that go-to person. I've heard countless stories from advisors that they held a seminar two years ago and now just recently that registrant booked a meeting with them off their Facebook page. Or one advisor wow. told me that they had retired. They weren't in the business anymore and they got a phone call and it was a, it was a gentleman that attended a tax event five years ago and <laughs> followed and stalked them to find out who they were. So hey, you know what? You gave this tax presentation five years ago. And now I'm looking to retire. You know, can we work together? But wow. seminars have that power of credibility and it's not always a quick win. There's others lead generation type um, mechanisms out there, but seminars can be a grind. It can take someone time to say, Hey, I got this education. Let me look into this. And okay, now something happened. A life event came up. And now they're ready to move forward with you. So staying top of mind is more important than ever. And you really have advantages today that we've never seen in the industry before. You can nurture through, you know, it's not just a, a mailing a newsletter once a month. You can nurture through email. You can nurture with relevant content. You can host secondary events virtually. Let's say you do a bunch of seminars live and then you want to host a, you know, the Secure Act just comes out and you want to host a webinar and educate those people again. Staying top of mind with things like that are absolutely a wonderful way to stay in top of mind with these people. And then there's social media. If you use social media as a tool, if you use social media as a nurturing platform, mm -hmm. you can absolutely stay in front of these prospects for years. What's nice is think of, think of your cell phone as the new fridge. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what I mean by that is when is the last time your client or your prospect ever got a letter in the mail with a picture of their grandkids in it? Oh. And I tell you, when I, when I was young, when I was eight years old and I go over to my grandma's house, there was pictures of every single grandkid on the fridge, right? right? And that's always, always on there. And that doesn't happen anymore. But I guarantee you, grandma's seen pictures of her grandkids today. And you know where she saw them? She saw them on her phone as right. she was scrolling through Facebook. Right. And if you can stay top of mind, if you can stay in front of your clients or your, even your prospects in that fashion, relevant content, you know, post something valuable, you know, something that makes you a human being, but man, who wouldn't want to be grandkid? You know, they're scrolling through Facebook and it's grandkid, grandkid, grandkid. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's your face sharing something important with about 401ks or Medicare or anything really anything, grandkid, 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 you, <laughs> who wouldn't want that credibility? Who wouldn't want that, you know, that, that personal touch and social media really allows you to do that. So if you have a robust professional social media presence that has good content on it, you can stay top of mind with these seminar registrants for years. And when that light bulb goes off and that life event happens where they say, you know what, I absolutely need a financial advisor. They're going to go right back to that person that two years ago taught them all about taxes and retirement. And then they've stayed top of mind. And six months ago, I read a great article they shared. And then two months ago, I saw that post where their office was out at uh, celebrating their whatever, right? right? That person is going to be the first person and they pick up the phone and they call. Seminar registrations are not something that you should just throw away. Seminar attendees that don't convert, those are gold that are just sitting there waiting until that life event happens. And you just need to stay top of mind with those people. Oh, Brad, this is just chock full of great seminar best practice hints here. Thanks, Brad. Brad Swinehart of White Glove. To subscribe to this podcast, simply use the subscribe button on this page. And to share with friends and colleagues, there is a share button. I'm Patrice Sikora. Let's talk again later. Thank you for listening to Be Advised, Leading with Value with Brad Swinehart. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of White Glove. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service providers with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning.